Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here at the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building and waiting to be profiled are Kathy Groover and filmmaker Jonathan Holif. Pittsburgh native, author, health and wellness expert, Kathy Groover studied at the Harvard School of Medicine and the National Institute of Health. She graduated from Point Park University with a degree in theater and earned a PhD from Clayton University. You may have heard her on the radio, NPR and CBS, seen her on TV, or attended one of her lectures around the country. Maybe you've already read her books, one of them, Conquering Your Stress, and the other one, The Alternative Medicine Cabinet. But if you haven't, she's going to tell us all about it. The one thing I love in conquering uh, is when you say, I like a buffet of options. Mm -hmm. What is that? Well, everybody has different things that they're going to be drawn to. Something that works for you might not work for me, might not work for my dad, might not work for my neighbor. So my job as an educator is to make sure I give people a huge array of options so they can pick and choose what's going to work for them. It's like a buffet. So that's what's so good. So what are mind and body uh, techniques? Oh, it ranges everything from massage, which has become so mainstream now, meditation, visualization, affirmations, even acupuncture, yoga, tai chi. There are so many different things you can do to connect that mind-body in yourself and decrease that stress response. And why? Oh, because it's for the stress response. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, why do we want to connect those in our body? Well, we're, we have that disconnect. You know, we talk so much about health in our society, and we talk about you know eating organic and a low BMI and losing weight and exercise. We don't talk about about the quality of our thoughts and what that stress response is doing to us and that's one of the keys to better health. What is that stress response doing mm -hmm. to us because I think it's like heavy. It is really heavy <laughs> and no one you know our doctors don't ask us about that they ask us this you know five pages of questions but they never say are you stressed what is stressing you out? Because well people always say I'm stressed if they're like running to an appointment they're stressed right? Right. But R what kind of heavy stress is well, I mean, we're being bombarded, bombarded by stress at all phases. It's coming from external and it's coming from internal. And the thing about the external stress is we have to remember we can't control that. We can't control the traffic. We can't control right. the IRS. We can control our reaction to that. That's and with the internal stress, it's with our thoughts, with our words, with things we're daydreaming about. They estimate that we have about 60,000 thoughts a day and that 50,000 of those are negative. Negative. That's a lot of negative thoughts. And that is why we're experiencing all this stress, all this illness. About 60 to 80 percent of our doctor's visits are related to stress. Visiting. But going is stressful, too. Well, that's true. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, but we can change our thoughts about that. We still have to go. So you talk about visualization and guided imagery. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Is that something that takes over the stress problem? It does because you figure if we're fantasizing about something negative and what's interesting about our brains is the brain doesn't understand if what we're thinking about is really happening or not. So if I had you right now think about the most horrible experience you've ever had, which I'm not going to ask you to, <laughs> your body would react as if you were, re if you were no. experiencing it again. So these fantasies we have that are negative where we go to the worst extreme possible, we're having a physiological reaction to that. So if we fantasize about positive things, and visualize our immune system, um, or bones knitting, or you know, we have the ability to change our physiology. It's it's amazing and phenomenal. Bones knitting is mm -hmm. interesting because if you're in, you've you've come out of surgery or you've broken a foot, you're talking about bones working. What do you do? How yes. do you do that? I I started visualizing when I was 15. I was taught by a gentleman I did a show with, and you can visualize your immune system activating. Um, I just recently had, of all things, a flying trapeze accident. Oh yeah, because you that, that's how you were. 
relieve your stress on the trapeze? Stress. Yep, trapeze and hip hop. Uh, but I, I landed wrong, I got tangled in the net, I really mangled my foot, and my doctor said, stay off it for 10 days. I was doing a dance show in 10 days. I healed so quickly, and I did that with affirmations and visualization. We all have the ability to do that, whether it's lowering blood pressure, boosting the immune system, we can do it. So how do you do it? What do you do? I activate my immune system by picturing the immune system, and the more visual you can make it, the more phenomenal it's going to work in your body. What do you look at? Little well, something going around like this? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Whether it's well, wait, it, it depends on who you are. Whether it's ants rushing to the area like a picnic and oh. carrying stuff away, oh. or I have a little—I don't tell many people this—I have a little construction worker that I picture in my body, yeah. and he runs around and fixes things. So oh, he so brings he's his toolbox. He's Exactly, really? and that's how I fixed a cracked vertebrae in my back when I was in college. But that's really kind of logical. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's logical. Maybe somebody doesn't believe it, but it is the idea of what you're saying. It is, and, and I'm not saying that you know we can sit around and visualize, and we're never going to get sick again. No, you know this the mind body connection is a component to it, and we still have to deal with the physical. We still have to deal with the environmental, the genetic. But if this helps even 10 percent. Why would we not do that? There's no side effects and it's free. What is a warning sign of stress? Oh, the jaw clenching. Because you've got it all in here. I it's do. so great. You can't put it down. Oh, thanks. And it's so concise. I mean, you can open a page and you've got everything right there. Yep, yep. Some of the warning signs are stress, and we're all feeling these. Uh, jaw tension, headaches, uh, that just anxiety feeling, that feeling in the pit of your stomach like something's about to go wrong. Road rage. I have oh. never seen so many people angry on the freeway. That is a way that they can feel like they're in control. We feel like we're in this car where you know we're in our own space and we can yell and scream and get that stress out. It's not really the healthiest way, of course. I was going to say, is that good? Uh, no. <laughs> we want to get it out, but we don't want to harm the people around us. <laughs> so, so you studied at the Benson Henry Institute. What is their specialty? I don't know what, where that is. Yeah, that's at Harvard. Oh, as you mentioned, there. and Herbert Benson oh, is an MD, and he has written dozens of books specifically on what he coined the relaxation response. So we have mm -hmm. that stress response, that fight or flight response, the heart rate quickens and the breathing quickens and we're ready to either run or fight. He found that by invoking the relaxation response, you could turn off that stress response, all the hormones would go back to normal. So I studied with him. He was a rock star. So that's so part excited. of visualization that yes. you were saying, right? And, and taking your taking it on yourself mm -hmm. so he tells you to relax yes how do you do that that's not that man going through your body fixing things no he fixes things for me and i'm, I'm he fixed it already he fixed it already <laughs> um i'm very type a i'm very driven i'm an only child i was raised by my dad who was very competitive so i'm getting it from all sides so uh, tell me to sit on a pillow and meditate i'm not real good at it but at the benson henry institute for mind body medicine they taught us mini meditations which just take a few minutes a day. Ah. It's concentrating on your breath. And on the inhale, you think, I am. And on the exhale, you think, at peace. And you just repeat oh, that. That's what you said in the book. Yes, I know. And it's so simple. And I can do it. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. So the other thing that I wanted to know is what's BioDot? Oh, <laughs> we kind of went through this, you see, right. so I'm going through some of these things. Things in the book. Bio dots are really fun. They're little dots. They look like little bindies that you put on your forehead, and they are sensitive measures of temperature because when you're stressed, <laughs> your hands drop oh, in temperature a little bit. So you put it on the what they call the anatomical snuff box at that little point right here between the, the pointer finger and the thumb, and it changes colors like a mood ring. Oh, it does. And what's really fascinating oh. is it. it's a really interesting experiment in a way to gauge your stress response. And you would think, oh, well, geez, I know when I'm stressed. Does it turn different colors? It does turn different colors. It's not broken. They did assure us of that. So if it stays <laughs> black, people would go up and say, my dot's broken. And they'd I say, know. no, you're just stressed out. Um, so it indicates a really subtle change. So things that you didn't even know put my you in those... My mouth is hanging open. <laughs> That's okay. I'm listening to you. Ah. <laughs> things you didn't even know would put you into a stress response does. And so if you can see this visual illustration of little things, you can imagine what the big things are doing to us. You talked about meditation. Mm -hmm. um, another thing you mentioned is herbs. Yes. So. Lavender is just one of the classics. It's so great, and you can smell it. You can put it in tea. Um, I love putting it in a bath. Oh. So get an old, um, you know, an old pantyhose or some little muslin bag. Fill it full of lavender and put it in your bath. 
Um, if and you, that just it, it calms really you? It really helps relax. You can put it under your pillow at night. That scent is incredibly soothing, and I still have a massage practice, oh, and dear. the majority of people pick the lavender massage cream. Well, what about the eucalyptus? When you're talking about that, because that's another yep. one they use, right? Yep, that's my second choice. Eucalyptus, that's more invigorating, and I use that a lot because it actually does help the deeper muscles relax a little bit. So, you know, aromatherapy is great. I have a whole chapter on that. And I know, you did so wonderful. <laughs> and the other thing that I love is, like you, you say, how to stay sick. A chapter on how to stay sick. Right. But those are all, you have to do the opposite of all those. Right. Or how to stay healthy. Exactly. Exactly. I had originally, in my first book, The Alternative Medicine Cabinet, I had done this how to stay sick list. And one of my <laughs> friends who I had write the book said, that is so funny and that is so appropriate, but I'm so depressed now. Why don't you write another chapter on how to stay healthy, <laughs> oh, making all, and I went, oh, what a great idea. So. I, I talk about those all the time. It's such a great illustration because people, you know, get about halfway through and laugh and then go, oh, I do that. Oh, I know. So how stop. to stay sick? One or two. Don't drink enough water. Um, um, keep, ask, yep, keep asking why me. Think you're the only one that has anything bad happen. Don't laugh. Laughing's for silly people. You don't need to laugh. It's not, not good but for you But then if you do the opposite, that keeps you healthy, right? Absolutely. Drinking enough water. <laughs> staying positive. Laughing. We did laughter therapy when I was at Harvard. And I was sitting in a room with 120 physicians laughing and cackling. And you couldn't help but just, you felt like a kid. So he makes you do that because yeah. it, it gives you the, what? Um, the chemicals, the endorphins, the average. It, give, it, it gives you the uh, approval. Gives you the approval that you can do that. Exactly. That you can laugh. Exactly. The average child laughs. I think the stat was three to four hundred times a day. Do you know how much the average adult laughs? Oh, we never laugh. Like fifteen. Maybe that's why I feel so good. Yes. <laughs> It is. I love to laugh. So, Kathy, one of the things in the alternative medicine cabinet is this um, 10 ways of, about nutrition, right? Yes, my top so, nutrition, right. What is it, 10 top? My nutrition pick. So things oh, like blueberries picks. and oh. garlic. Eggs, to me, are one of the most perfect oh. foods. I really? love eggs. Really? And they say it's got so much cholesterol. Don't believe it. That's one of those uh, things that we hear on TV that's wrong. Things we hear, not, this isn't wrong, of course, but things we hear on TV, <laughs> you can be incorrect. No, eggs are fabulous. And the only time eggs aren't real good for us is when the yolk has been broken and then exposed to oxygen. So if you're on a cruise or if you're at a breakfast oh, bar oh. where there's that big pile of scrambled eggs that always looks a little anyway, that's the time not to eat the eggs. Because but if you just have a fried egg yep. at home, that's my I do. Or scrambled eggs at home. Scrambled are not the best. Hard boiled, soft boiled. Really? Where the yolk isn't broken is actually one of the healthiest ways oh, to eat it. Oh, is that what you're saying? And the I white see. of the egg, the nutrients in that actually counteract the cholesterol in the yolk. And there's no good evidence that eating cholesterol raises our cholesterol. That's one of those myths. So that's a good myth. The other thing is stay away from high fructose things, because I uh, noticed that I read that in here. Yes, high fructose corn syrup. Don't believe the hype is not as natural as sugar. <laughs> um, and, and even right. if it is, even if that's completely true, the bottom line is it's genetically modified, which is also very bad, <laughs> and it's put in all the cheap and processed foods. There's no nutritional value, and we need to go back to nutrient-dense foods. That's what we need in our bodies. So how do you know that it's got so much fructose in it? That has to be labeled. So I if think. you're drinking soda or anything packaged, processed, sweetened, it's going to have high fructose corn syrup in it, and you can, unless it says oh, organic, which it won't, uh, you can guarantee <laughs> that it's been genetically modified, and we've got to cut that out. And before we leave, tell me your quick health uh, type energy boosters. Oh, breathing, water. Those are energy boosters? Yes. In fact, that afternoon slump, it's not a caffeine deficiency. I thought it was like I needed some sugar. No, we <laughs> need to breathe. And the other thing, that, one of the keys, and this goes back to eggs, start with a really good breakfast, one that has protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So what is a good breakfast? Um, eggs, Bacon and eggs. <laughs> that's what I eat, and I'm healthy as a horse. Um, eggs, you know, even if it's just grab a hard-boiled egg, have some cheese oatmeal really? um, with some flax on it or something, but you know, people that grab the coffee and some sort of pastry, mm -hmm. you're not giving yourself the nutrients that you need. And just like we need gas in our car to run, we have to have that fuel for the day. So if you're tired in the afternoon, breathe deeply, drink a bunch of water, and it'll probably perk you right up. Is that right? Mm -hmm. No sugar, mm -hmm. no nap. Well, naps are okay. <laughs> I don't want to take your nap Thanks. I'm going to take that and say Perfect. goodbye. <laughs> but thank you so much. And these books were like really fast reads and really easy. Oh, great. And that's what's so good about it. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for having me. Don't go away. We'll be right back with filmmaker Jonathan Holif.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here at our studio in the Hollywood Museum in the heart of Hollywood on Highland Avenue, and I'm with filmmaker Jonathan Joel Holif, who was born and raised in Canada, studied at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, and the Vancouver Institute for Communication Arts. He's an award-winning consultant who had headed and also heads his company, the Hollywood Madison Group. He's the founder of the Association of Celebrity Personal Assistants, and he's been a PA to Faye Dunaway and Don Johnson. He's a publicist. Uh, you're, you have this long list. A talent agent, a TV producer, and your wonderful documentary, My Father and the Man in Black. And you're in black. I am. <laughs> I know. That's my, so great. It was my mother's idea, actually. Was it? <laughs> I'm so happy to have you, Jonathan. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And now, how did you start that Hollywood Madison group? What was that about? Because you say it's no longer a business, right? That's true. I did close it when my uh, father passed away and I moved back to Canada, which was the impetus for the oh, film. I However, see. I uh, had been a television producer for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And when I moved to Los Angeles, my credits didn't mean very much here. So I started out uh, at the William Morris Agency. And I soon discovered there was an unserved niche in Hollywood and that rather than represent stars, I should represent corporations who wanted to engage stars. Oh, I see. And then you went on to do a lot of television work with them, right? Yes. Um, we did a lot of celebrity endorsements that it featured uh, commercial campaigns, but also uh, press launches and personal appearances and events. How did you find the celebrities to do that? A lot of them I know were, um, you know, 501c3 organizations, but but some of them were commercial as well. Yeah, no, in fact, most of our clients were Fortune 500 companies. Um, my firm represented Sony and Philips Electronics and... The Getty? The Getty, yes, yes. absolutely. And, and a Getty. number of uh, pharmaceutical companies as well. But suffice it to say that um, you also mentioned that I worked as a PA, a celebrity personal assistant. And at the time, I amassed, not on purpose, but by in the course of, of my job, ah. all of these contacts with celebrities in their homes, which allowed me to bypass the agents and go directly to the stars in recruiting them for my clients. So did you have to leave Canada for good, or were you coming back and forth when you were doing these, uh, this work? In the early years, and I spent 15 years in Hollywood, I would go back and forth, ah. and I continued to produce a show once a year in Toronto. But fortunately, as, as a Canadian, we're allowed to have dual citizenship. So I'm a citizen of both countries. Oh, so that's great. And yeah. you have a, an apartment in Hollywood, and you're, that's right. you're so, part of everything now. Are you here all the time? Well, truth be told, I had left Hollywood for good, ostensibly, uh, when my father passed away. And, and how so long ago was that? That was uh, 2005. Right. And so no one is more surprised than I am that I'm back here with a film. But. Let's talk about that film, because when you think about saying my father and the man in black, you're not saying Johnny Cash. That's right. But we all know who the man in black is, right? We do. And um, what motivated you to make that film? It's your first film. That's right. Um, well, my father committed suicide, and we had been estranged for 20 years. And when he died, without leaving a note, um, I basically crashed I was working and living in Hollywood. I found I couldn't get out of bed to go to work. And I started to realize that my entire career, if not my entire adult life, was designed to win my father's approval. Oh, so that's why you crashed. Because if you hadn't seen him for 20 years, exactly. it was like a different I, kind of thing, right? Exactly. I thought one day a letter would come, perhaps, that would say, you're OK, kid. But that never happened. So I closed my business, drove back to Canada. Oh. And three months later, a movie called Walk the Line opened. And that was, uh, it was almost a conspiracy of, of events that led to my making this film. And so. After you saw Walk the Line, you knew your father had worked for Johnny Cash. Right. Did you know Johnny Cash? Did you I, ever meet him? I did, yes. Um, the fact is, though, that my situation with my family was so estranged, and uh, I'm one of so many that come from dysfunctional families, <laughs> that I really had um, no memory of my life as a child before the age of 10. Call it repressed memory or what have you. I knew just the basics, but I was... Surprised, indeed, I learned more about my father from his obituary from the man 
himself. And one of those things was that he not only handled Johnny during the important years, the walk the line years. And the beginning years, right? Indeed, but he also hired June and put her with Johnny. And those were all uh, revelations for me. Here you are, you're back in Canada, you've got all this background in Hollywood, you have a personal assistant, you, through your personal assistant, through your publicity, through all the work, why didn't you make a film, another film? Didn't you have a, like a lot, a kind of a, a list of things that you could have done? No, as a matter of fact, <laughs> um, I'm an accidental filmmaker. Um, <laughs> I didn't study it. I think I failed grade 11 English, to tell you the truth. So um, you wrote it, actually, right? You oh, had to I did. Write it, yeah. I did. But the fact so, is, is that all those years, I was, I was trying to better my father professionally. And because he was a, a manager, I thought I had to be a talent agent. And oh. so it never occurred to me that I might have anything to say artistically. So, so you never, even coming in contact no, with all these people. No, and this like, was pure, purely coincidental. And so once you got there and you got out of bed, <laughs> <laughs> I think the great thing about the, about the film is that you found this locker. I did, and um, while it is disguised, perhaps, as a Johnny Cash movie, um, uh. I wasn't motivated <laughs> uh, to tell the Johnny Cash story. Um, I went to that locker not to do, make a film, but rather to um, practice a little bit of um, personal therapy by taking uh -huh. notes and trying to learn about this father I never knew. How did your mom feel about all this? Because you were living with her then, weren't you? I was, and uh, she was still in mourning, and the phone was ringing off the hook because Walk the Line had come out. Uh -huh. Fans wanted to know if we had any memorabilia that needed a good home. Writers wanted to know about more about the Saul and Johnny relationship and why my father quit Johnny Cash at the height of his fame in the 1970s. All questions I could not answer. But I was motivated <laughs> to learn about my father. Everything you couldn't answer. Indeed. Was your mother answering them? What was she doing? Well, she didn't. Um, she want. She she wants to help everyone. She's one of those people. <laughs> and uh, I had just shown up, and I didn't like the fact that, at her age, she was being called upon, upon uh, to try to recall these things and answer questions. And I said, Mom, please. Just let me take care of it. And that's when she told me about the storage locker. Oh, and then she told you about the storage locker. The, the interesting thing is, I think, you took the liberty of depicting these stories, which is a different way for a documentary to be told. It's kind of like true and not true in a way. Well, I would debate one thing with you. Okay. Um, it's all true. Um, you're right. I do rely on no dialogue recreations shot on film. and. For purists in the documentary world, they don't like that very <laughs> That's much. That's what I was asking because it's like a question that comes up yeah, when you talk it, about it, a documentary. There, I've often heard people describe it as um, as fiction or or docudrama. Docudrama. But the, but the fact is, is not a single word uttered in the film was manufactured. Not a single situation. What your audience might not know is that in this storage locker, I discovered that my father had kept an audio diary from the time I was born until the time he died. 60 hours worth of contemporaneous reporting about his life with Cash and his life as a father. And indeed, he recorded his phone calls with Cash as well. That was so, pretty weird. That yeah. was really something, because you can't do that nowadays, right? No. Without saying, I'm recording exactly. you or whatever. And then, so you say there was no words, back to depicting this, there were no words exchanged. How did you... And, and then you didn't show any faces or anything. You were really good about just saying, yeah. I opened the locker and then there's a hand opening the locker or that type of yeah. thing. Did you write that all in? I did. It, it took seven and a half years to make this film. That's a good, that's, um, I was going to ask you how long it took. It took a very long time, but suffice it to say that I not only am not a big fan of talking head documentaries. <laughs> but, or, t or talk shows. No, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm not used to being in, on this side of the camera either, so I'm, I'm nervous right now. But the fact is, is that I had Johnny and Saul telling their own story in their own words and voices. And th this is the inside untold story of Cash in the 1960s. 
there was no need for me to go to Chris Christopherson and say, what do you remember oh. about that thing that happened 40 years ago? I see. So I you didn't have to had, interview exactly, those people. Exactly. Ah, oh, that's but interesting. The, the whole film is not recreation, as you know. Oh, no, 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 The other no, no. half of it is motion graphics and stock footage and movie and TV show clips. and. I was going to ask you where you got the vintage film. Did he have any film in the he locker? He did. He did. But, of course, I had to find a lot of it myself. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to make sure that everything was authentic, and that's perhaps why the movie took so long. You know, um, you you go back and talk about your family, immigrant family, yeah. coming to Toronto, and your father wanting to please his father, working with him. And yeah. so I, you can see this line that you draw. Yeah, I'm pleased to say that this film has um, traveled to 15 countries in the film festival circuit. And That's so great. It's perceived um, as not a Johnny Cash film so much as a story about fathers and sons, right. and the immigrant story. My father, having gotten to know him in death, reminds me of kind of a mix between, um, you know, what makes Sammy run, a little bit of <laughs> Willie Loman, um, you know, Mordecai Richler's character. Um, so, yes, these were people who were first-generation North Americans who invented themse reinvented themselves. And my father did so as an entrepreneur and ended up meeting one of the icons of 20th century music. I know, and made him into something. Found him and made him. And, you know, they say there's so, so much a part of your career is like this snippet or that snippet. But you took that whole snippet that your father, Saul Holif, made. Right. I, I don't go so far as to say that Saul made Johnny, but there's <laughs> no, there's but no I mean, question that the combination of these two guys... Right. Um, as different as they are on paper, but both fighting similar demons. Johnny addicted to the pills, right. my father to the bottle, my father the marketer, Johnny the talent. They together did some great things in the 1960s and 70s. They really were a perfect match. And as we get to the end of the film, before you even say it, I'm like writing notes, break the cycle. Yeah. And then you say it on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit uh, pithy, perhaps, but... <laughs> The fact is it took making this film to realize a fundamental truth, yeah. and that is that, uh, you know, unless we break the cycle of family dysfunction, <laughs> uh, we pass that on to our children. And my father treated me like uh, his, father. his father treated him. Yeah, exactly. which is really interesting. And I'm going like, oh, he read my mind. He put break, break the cycle on there. It was very enjoyable. I think... Um, People have to see it to see the, the reason Saul left and, and how he felt about it. I don't think we have to say all of that. I was pretty involved in the fact that the religious part took over Johnny's life. Yeah, yeah indeed. And it was uh, totally different from your father's point of view. Indeed, and that's the biggest surprise about this movie. That's what I thought. And you can imagine a lot of people say to this film, another Johnny Cash movie, we know Johnny Cash. That's why you said my father. That's great that you yeah, said indeed. that. Indeed, but the fact is is that this movie is all brand new information from the inside, and the biggest surprise is a close look at Johnny's conversion to fundamentalist Christianity in 1971 and the effect it had on his atheist Jewish manager <laughs> and indeed on his career. And it takes on Shakespearean proportions, doesn't it? With totally, the, totally. The movie in Israel and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, so. it was real. it was compelling. And thank I you. thank you so much for coming today. Thank you very much. And thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Write to me at J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. See you next time.